perfection, redemption of property. Everything in Israel had a cost. People had cost, houses had cost, property had cost. God would set the cost. Um, and in our society today, we don't like to think about that. Um, it's a big movement, and you know, in our Constitution, you know, all men are created equal. And we say that, and we understand the thought pattern. But we also understand um, that certain people earn more money because of their gifts, talents, and skills, and others don't. Uh, it may be a, a disparage with uh, skin color. So we want everybody to be equal, but in the reality of life, everybody's not equal. And so we must understand that. So what God, he sets price, which is going to be interesting as we jump into this section tonight. So someone go ahead and read Leviticus 25, 32 through 34, please, as we talk about uh, redemption land and the Levites in these scriptures. Now, we've talked about the Levites throughout early parts of the scripture. The Levites were the workers in the temple. So God had already set aside a um, special property for them that would always be connected. Um, even um, pastors and priests in our day and time in America, we can set aside what's called a housing allowance um, that's not taxable, per se, um, because they still believe in this perpetual property that's being set up. And so if you notice here, the Levites' houses and lands were perpetually theirs. God said, if you work in the temple, you work for the temple, I'm going to make sure that you have a house to stay, um, which, which makes sense. Those who work in the church, they uh, live of the church, and to make sure um, that they're comfortable so they can continue to do God's work. So God set up the lands for the Levites and their houses would be perpetually theirs. Remember on last time we were talking about um, the year of Jubilee. And Jubilee was what year? 50, all right? So within that, the Levites' land would always stay with them. Everybody else's would actually go back, but the Levites would have that perpetual land. Now let's get to lending to the poor. God always has a heart for the poor. He cares for the poor. Um, there's so many poor amongst us. Um, but in America, we have really, really been blessed uh, tremendously. But God had to set up standards and laws to deal with the poor. Let's go ahead and jump in this next section. Leviticus 25, 35 through 38. Someone read, please. Now, this is important. God has to set up these things because he knows our heart. Um, without Jesus, we all want to turn a, pit, a quick buck. You know, we, we always want to um, get rich a lot of times off of someone if God wasn't in our heart. So the Lord had to set up this. If an Israelite fell into debt and poverty, his Jewish creditors were not to what? Oppress him. I'm telling you, in our day in society, there are a lot of people that are in debt. Maybe you or some of you are in debt, and we've tried to teach over these years um, being debt-free, getting out of debt, because it's slavery, actually. That's what we're going to go into, uh, slavery in our next section. But um, when you are um, oppressed with debt, it takes away your life. And so God said, I want to set a standard um, that you're not caught up in this type of lifestyle. They were not to charge what? Interest on money or demand additional food for food that was lent. So literally, in the Israelite society, they could not charge interest to their brothers. From what I understand, some studies that I've done, that is still in some of the Jewish communities. 
that they'll lend you money outside of the Jewish community and they'll charge you interest, but they won't charge interest to their own brothers. And I, I think that's very commendable. And so the interest is for the people outside of their group, but not inside their group. But we see in our day and time, so many times, we're the first people to jump on our family and charge them interest and cause all kinds of problems. But God sets these standards to make sure that there's an understanding of how he feels that we should treat people, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, let's get to slavery. Slavery is a tough one. Um, we've been taught here in America. Um, we've seen so many pictures about slavery. Slavery has been around for a long time. And even though we don't have uh, the Kunta Kintes in our society now, I still believe, as we talked about that, many people are in uh, slavery. Um, we, we just don't call it that. But anytime you're in bondage, anytime somebody controls you, that is slavery. Notice as we jump into this section, someone read Leviticus 25, 39 through 43, please. So this is important because remember we were in Egypt, they were under slavery. And God said, I don't ever want that to come back amongst you. So he had to remind you, remind them, don't put your brothers under slavery. But I'm going to redefine something for you. Notice this commentary. If an Israelite man was poor and desired to sell or indenture himself to provide a capital, he was to be treated kindly as a hired servant and released in the year of Jubilee, if not before. So Anytime you sell yourself uh, for a particular thing because you don't have the money, that is slavery. So give me some examples of, of slavery in America right now, according to that commentary. Prostitution, you sell yourself. <laughs> you can wish they at work. I guess the, depends on what type of work, you know, what type of work you're doing. Drugs. Trafficking. So we, we see slavery right now. And that's why I want you to live a free life. Thank God for jobs. But when you are encaptured by a job, when you feel like there's no way out and bills are kind of coming in on you, that really turns into slavery. And I, and I don't want anybody to, be, to have to live in that. But we see so many people that are selling themselves to do whatever they can do just to make ends meet. And here, God set a standard. He said, when the year of Jubilee comes, those people who sold themselves as servants, they would actually be set free. Wouldn't you love that? That if you got in debt and you, you survived for 50 years to the year of Jubilee, all your debt was released. All your debt was wiped out. But to be honest, for some of us, if you haven't learned the principles, you would get right back into debt. That's the sad thing about it. You, you would get right back into that same life or, or circle of life. Uh, look at this next section, uh, Leviticus 25, 44 through 46. Someone read, please. All right, so God says this standard. I want you to understand this first part. Israel was permitted to have what kind of slaves? Yeah, heathen slaves. Outside of the Israelite community, they were allowed. Um, and, you know, people disagree with slavery and everything. I still, we prove that slavery is still around. 
Um, some of you, uh, maybe your parents were working for somebody in their house. Um, you didn't want to call it slavery, but they sold their life to assist and help out with someone else. Um, they were indentured servants in a sense. So notice that the Israel were permitted to have slaves of the heathen. Their children would also be slaves what? This is true. I'm going to take you to a broad principle that I've seen. If a parent is in slavery or in debt, generally that will be passed down to the children. They will, they will live that same lifestyle. They will never break out of that mold that's set by the parents. I'm not saying that it can't be done, but generally they stay in that same cycle. We see here with the scriptures, so that parent of that heathen, they would become slaves, and the children would be brought in that slave uh, lifestyle. Why? Why would they stay slaves? Anybody? I want to make sure you're getting this processing. Nothing different. They, they're living off of what they've seen. So they were taught to be good slaves. So what do they do? They grow up and they stay in that same system. Um, it's very important. Um, make sure that you're teaching your kids not just what you have learned, but broaden their horizon so they're not caught at the same level that you're at. Yes, ma'am. Another level. It's tough. Look at that last part of that. Um, it says, this should be viewed as a form of the just what? Judgment of God upon the wicked and idolatrous practices of the heathen and differs from modern slavery, which was not commanded of God. So we do see um, the differences here. We do see judgment. The wages of sin is death. Um, some people... They put some things in their life, um, judgment is going to come quickly. So that whole process, so it's a little different as we look at the scriptures. Bianca. I think, too, is, is the Israelites, again, that just occurred to you, you're talking about a heathen nation. So if you, if you become a slave <coughs> under the Jewish nation, the Israelite nation, then you're going to be doing the practices that the Jews do. So in a sense, you have a covering that you wouldn't have as a heathen person. I mean, I think about um, Naaman's <coughs> slave. He was Jewish, and so it went backwards. But because he was Jewish and she had Jewish practices, he knew about God. And so in the reverse, if you have a slave, if you're, just like if you're a Christian, you would rather a Christian person own somebody than another heathen person who just going to do heathen practices. It's this way they get introduced to the God of the Israelites. They get introduced to the customs of the Israelites. And they can be saved even though they're slaves. Um, and there's been many movies about that, uh, even here in America, where there were slave owners who were Christian, uh, and they treated their uh, slaves with respect. Of course, you had others that weren't Christian, uh, did not treat them with respect. So we see that whole process here, and God does understand it. And again, there still is modern slavery um, right here in America. Now I need somebody to read a big section here. I uh, know y'all ready. Uh, Leviticus 25, 47 through 54, please. Thank you. 
shall be according to the term of an idle person, if there are still many years remaining according to them, he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money with which he was bought. And if there remains but a few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall reckon with them, and according to his year, he shall repay them the price of his redemption. He shall be with them as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not brook with women over him in their sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. Tell you that year of Jubilee looks good, huh? Yeah. Now, now I'm going to sum this up. It was a lot of back and forth in it, but it's real simple. If a Jew sold himself to a Gentile who happened to be living in the land, the Jew could always be bought back and set free. Um, if you saw, I think it was like 12 years slave. Uh, I think that's what it was, that title. Um, they, it was a lot of redemption in there. And um, he got caught up in a cycle that he couldn't get out because nobody would buy him back. And he got in this whole ring. Well, this is what this is talking about. There was actually a cost that you could buy a slave out of slavery. And okay, so if you were sold into that, you sold yourself, there was still hope that you could come out of that slavery um, place. Look at this. The redemption price was determined by the number of years remaining until the year of Jubilee. The relative redeeming the Jew could use him as a hired servant until the Jubilee. If no relative redeemed him, then he automatically went free in the year of Jubilee. So a relative um, who was blessed could actually buy back his other relative could set them free, which we see God instituting and encouraging family to get involved. But I'm seeing in this society, so many people are turning against family. Um, you know, people who could help for whatever reason are just not helping family. So we see God saying, okay, this is not how it's, I'm going to put some things, some laws that people can be set free. And again, if it's not done, then the year of Jubilee, that's going to be an important time that everyone's set free. Leviticus 2555, someone read, please. Now, this is important because God always reminds, as we're going through this laws, he puts the Israelites in their place, and we should be in our place, too. Look at that commentary. This verse is a vivid reminder that the Israelites and their land, what? Belong to, Belong to the Lord, and that he should be recognized as rightful owner. This is key, and I, I believe, as a Christian, we've got to have this idea that everything that we have is really not ours anyway. It's the Lord's. If it had not been for his grace and mercy, we wouldn't have. And, and to be honest, uh, some of us don't have as much as we think we have anyway, right? D. Correct. You would be blessed him. Very good. And that last part, it says, neither God's people nor God's land could be sold permanently. Why? Because it belonged to God. That's why the Jubilee was set, that it could cycle back uh, to the rightful owners, but God was the rightful owner. And that's why we're, remember where we are, we're at Mount Sinai, um, we're going to get to the promised land, and Joshua is going to take us into the promised land, but God is setting all this standard up, that when we get to the land of Canaan, we know how to live. He can run. The Israelites would be, um, but we could use it as a symbol you know, of, of being set free. But the Israelite was set at a specific time, that 50 year, to be set free. Because if you had kind of stagnant, it would get really confusing. Well, you did. You had your jubilee. Be set free. Dick Lenny.
It was slavery. It, it was slavery. If you were controlled, you were controlled. That whole thought pattern. Look at this next part. Promises of blessing and retribution. So we're going to get into the blessing and cursings. Um, this chapter forms a fitting conclusion to this book of the law. I told you we were getting close to finishing and summing it all up. It clearly promises blessings for obedience and what? Chastisement for not keeping God's law. That's still in our day and time. We get blessed if we do what God tells us to do. We're cursed if we don't. Simple. I'm learning more and more. You do what God tells you to do, blessings come. If you don't, there's judgment. There's curses that come from that. It is one of the great chapters of the Old Testament and is essentially repeated by Moses 40 years later in Deuteronomy 28. And we'll actually pick up that when we get to that section. Um, let's jump into this. Leviticus 26, 1 uh, and 2. Someone read, please. You shall not make idols for yourself, neither a carved image nor a, sit, nor a, a sacred pillar. And you shall rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up any engraved stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. This is important. God knew his people. When you let them loose, they were going to do crazy stuff. Yeah. It always happens. So he has to put the standards. He has to, he has to write it out specifically. God called for his people to repudiate idolatry and to center their worship in his appointed use of the sanctuary with its sacrificial system. Uh, we're going to see in the wilderness, there's going to be a time, and we've already actually went through that um, with the children of Israel. Moses will go up to the top, and then all of a sudden the children of Israel, they'll go crazy. They'll build an idol. Um, that won't be the first time. We're going to see this over and over again. God set standard. Nothing should be above him. He should always be lifted up. God does this so his people can walk in blessings. God gives us these directives so we can truly be blessed. So often we go against them and we cause problems for ourselves. Look at this next section. I love this section. Uh, Leviticus 26, 3 through 13. Someone read, please. All right, so God is putting out some blessing statements as we go into this. Sum it up, God promises that if you walk in his statutes, verse 3, he will provide what? Proper rainfall and abundant harvests. How do we apply that to our day and time? What does that mean? He'll take care of you. Um, he'll provide for you. And I believe we have been provided for you know, food, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, most of y'all look pretty healthy. I mean, really, we, we have been blessed, and we take that for granted. God has provided over and over again. Um, look at that next part, peace in their land, an easy victory over all enemies. I believe that we're, we're in that day and time. Uh, America is still blessed. We are still blessed. But in um, those blessings, I believe it can turn the curse real quick. We're respected. We're respected amongst um, all the nations. Even though there's a lot of stuff that's going on, our military is still strong, still powerful. But that can change so quickly. But at this point, God has blessed us. Look at that next part. Um, many children. Deacon Rudd got like 15. I know. He's got 10. <laughs> um, God is blessed. Um, 
we're living in a day that people are choosing not to have kids, but we have been blessed. Our health care is the best in the world. So God has put blessings with um, our children and a perfect relationship with their covenant-keeping God, their Redeemer. So that whole scripture, God is saying, if you do what I tell you to do, I want to build my relationship with you, and I want to bless you. God has always wanted to bless his children. The problem is we have to interpret what a blessing is. A blessing is not necessarily giving you a bigger car or a bigger house. That may not be a blessing. Now, the world says that's a blessing, but it's about having peace on the inside. Um, have you ever had a, a blessing that the world said and it drove you crazy? Right, because it's not. Um, I, I preached, um, was it Sunday, all that glitter is not gold or something like that. Um, we have to understand God wants to have a relationship on the inside of us. Yes, ma'am. It's about the motivation of the heart. And that's why these scriptures are important. God is saying, focus on me, not on you. It's what I've said. Look at this next part, Leviticus 26, 14, and 15. Someone read, please. All right, we, we stop right here briefly because there's always a flip side. To every blessing, there is a curse. Please understand that. And we all, oh, God is a good God. He is, but he's also a God of judgment. Because if he wasn't a God of judgment, he couldn't be a God of the goodness that you know also. There is a balance in that. He's always been that way. Look at this, but if Israel will not hearken unto God, then calamity unspeakable shall befall them. What follows becomes a history of Israel because they forsook God, broke his covenant of Mount Sinai, etc. All the major and minor prophets substantiated this on nearly every page. Israel has gone through throughout the generations, throughout history, over and over again, all because of disobedience. I believe we have been blessed, but I'm seeing a generation that's being broken. Um, families broken apart, um, divorce rates at an all-time high. Um, I, we just need to open our eyes, and it's because we've actually forsook the relationships that our forefathers had generations before uh, in the church. The church is not what it used to be. Um, God has blessed Ebenezer, our section, but a lot of churches are struggling. A lot of kids don't want to come to church anymore. They don't want the fellowship anymore because they weren't taught that whole process, and we're seeing a lot of breaking apart of our society. Yes, ma'am. Right. Scriptures talk about that. Um, every side, if you're blessed and you don't bless anybody else or you take that for granted, curses can come. It's a, it's a handshake. And so we can never take for granted. And that's why God puts this, that we never take for granted his blessings, his goodness, his grace. And because he's given so much, we want to extend that to somebody else. Let's get into this next section. I need a reader. <laughs> Twenty six sixteen through thirty one. Someone read, please. I'm your reader. Thank you. 
Wow, it makes the impact when you hear it out loud, right? What sticks out? Seven times. Seven times. Seven times. You, you, you don't want to go against God. The wages, I said this earlier, the wages of sin is death. That's why he loves us. He loves us so much, and he gives us all these directives so we don't have to suffer. Don't you see this? People who are struggling against God, and it just gets worse and worse and worse, this cycle. Um, let's sum it up. He says, I will also do this unto you. God's judgment of a wayward Israel was to take several forms. Number one, there would be disease, sorrow, foreign occupation, military defeat, ruled by foreigners, and a preoccupation of fear. This always happens in nations that turn away from God. Eventually it happens. The enemy comes in, and we see all of these things occurring. Look at that next part, number two. This really gets me. The plagues will be multiplied in intensity, and their efforts at producing will be what? <laughs> Fruitless. All because they chose not to do it God's way. Look at our society, even as Christians. You see people just can't make ends meet. No matter, I mean, we've got some people that we're connected with. It seems like they're always behind, always behind. It just can never get a break. And, and it's because they've got out of the will of God, and they're just kind of just going in this cycle of destruction. Their lives are being uh, destroyed, and their children's lives are being destroyed, all because they choose not to follow God's way, that whole process. Look at number three. The plagues will intensify even more according to your sins, all right, according to the sins you do. And wild beasts would destroy what? I... I don't want to make a strong correlation, but I just want you to start looking at news. We're seeing more strange things happen with wild animals that we just didn't see a lot of. Um, you know, young girls being dragged and killed by lions that get out of places, and we're seeing animals come up on um, yards and people fighting with these animals. There are a lot of things that are occurring, and I think we need to be aware. With the Israelites, God said, if you don't do what I tell you to do, the wild, I will use wild beasts as judgment, as judgment. I'm always amazed, even living in the city, you know, when you see things. We, we, we got a lot of wild animals around here. Even though we got all these houses, there are a lot of animals walking around. We got foxes and all kinds of stuff crossing the street at night. And I'm like, wow, you know, and, and, and to think that God can use those animals as judgment is amazing to me. Look at number four. Continued disobedience would result in what? Death. Death to some by foreign swords, pestilence with population centers, defeat by their enemies, and near starvation. All because of being out of the will of God. Number five, further disobedience even, even after all these punishments would yield starvation so severe that cannibalism would result. Large-scale death would ensue, and cities would be destroyed. This is the level. You keep going against God, eventually this is the point. And there are some nations now in the world that are suffering at this level of famine and starvation. Right now, Calcutta, India, some other places, you can find this is the level of destruction, all because people have turned against God's way. But specifically in context, this is for the Israelites. Any questions, comments so far? Yes, yes, there is. Um, sad to say it's not talked about a lot, but, but there is. And um, it's just sad to think that you could, we could be at that level, you know, that you would actually eat somebody. Isn't that, that sad? But the wages of sin is death. But, I mean, I mean we, we look at it in a sad, but look at um, drugs. You see people on drugs, and you see the level that they could get that they could sell their body. They would do certain things with their body. You think about that. You're like, how could they do that? So it's just another step to do something such as cannibalism. Yes. Yeah, this, this, um, this test that we just said, wasn't that pertaining to the Israelites, not the Gentiles? Yes, to the Gentiles. I mean, to the Israelites, but the Gentiles would even have worse. Remember, we just came out of Egypt, and notice all the plagues that God put on a Gentile nation, which was Egypt. 
and so um, they're already under judgment. And, and so much, when the Israelites, when we finally get them to Canaan, many of the Gentiles that are there are going to get kicked out. And, and we're going to have to deal with some touchy situations. Many of them are going to be killed. God is going to allow them to be wiped out completely. So that is the ultimate judgment. <laughs> Amen. Um, and we may not be physically cannibalizing people, but I'm seeing parents using kids and um, stealing Social Security numbers and all this kind of stuff. You're, you're about at that level when you start getting to that point yeah. just to survive. Yeah. Deacon Mevin. Even, even today, we still give you another chance to get it right. Amen. Thank God for his grace. But the problem is so many are not using it. They take it for granted. Look at this next section. Someone read Leviticus uh, 26, 32 to 39, please. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. God is warning them, I lead you a cloud by day, fire by night. I fight your battles. But when you get out of my will, I'm going to have to turn you over. And you're going to be overtaken uh, by stuff that's not even real. Um, we're living in a day and time, so many people, and if you have these, not putting you down, but so many people have psychological issues, fears, fears of everything. You know, I... I this is amazing. It's like we add another long name for another fear that comes and overtakes people year in and year out. And this is simply because we're not trusting God, staying with him. Look at that commentary. God's final answer to Israel's disobedience would be to scatter you among the heathen. Anybody see that now? Really intertwined, picking up the heathen's way. And then it says the Gentiles, he would also send fear among them and many would perish in foreign lands. Now, specifically in context with the Israelites, again, this has happened through history, and um, just recently in history, when we look at history as a long term, um, the Jews have been able to go back to a land, a specific land. But throughout history, if you think about the Holocaust, other things that have divided the Jewish nation, they've been sold in slavery, God was true to what he said. Um, the Jewish people have really gone through and suffered a lot. <laughs> And it's simply because they've been disobedient to God. Uh, you look at Revelations, there's going to be a time that God's going to bring judgment, and he says that a remnant is going to be saved, though. There's some Israelites that are going to be um, believing in Christ, and even now there's some Messianic Jews. So God has this all together, his chosen people. He has never forgot uh, them, and he's allowed us to be engrafted into this family. Uh, what a, a wonderful God we serve. Look at this next part as it continues on. Um, someone read this next section, uh, 40 through 42. Uh, 
what a, a great section to be able to stomp on. Look at that. But if they shall confess their iniquity, all right, as Deacon Mevin realized, God, you've given us so many chances. Now we can confess we were wrong and really turn back to God in a thoroughly humbled condition. Then will I, God, will remember my covenant with Jacob, with Isaac, with Abraham. What a beautiful picture with that. The Sinai covenant was a covenant of law, um, do this or else. But the Abrahamic co covenant, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, was completely of grace and can never be terminated by the wicked conduct of his people. Isn't that good news? Yes. No matter what you do, God still gives us grace and his mercy. But judgment does come, though. There is a limit to that whole process. Deacon Lenny. That's a good thing that he still loves us. Look at that final commentary. In God's providence, Israel will yet turn to the Lord when brought low by the Antichrist during the tribulation period in the future. God will intervene at the battle of Armageddon and spare his people Israel, the Jews, and establish the long-awaited kingdom that Christ promised. So what we see here within Leviticus will be fulfilled in Revelations. It is coming. But thank God for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on to your feet. Let's close out. Thank you, Lenny.